Hi there, my name is Gautam Nagaraj and welcome to this session on Red Hat OpenShift, the platform for digital transformation. So let's begin. It's well known that IT organizations' business these days is to create value for their organization. And the best way to create value for the organization is through the development of new applications and the ability to bring new features to your existing applications. Whether those be cloud native applications, i.e. you're going greenfield on the cloud, whether you're doing a lift and shift where you're moving your applications from on-premise, from being monolithic towards being microservices, whether that's in the field of AI and machine learning or your standard Java and .NET applications, we know that nowadays IT organizations need to be able to deliver more applications, deliver more features quickly, and also be able to basically fail fast and fail often so that they can find the way to work. We know now that the fundamentals of these are basically to have cloud native application development, to adopt containers, to adopt a hybrid cloud strategy. And we believe at Red Hat that Red Hat OpenShift, our enterprise container platform, is the right solution for you. So let's go dive in. IT needs to evolve for the digital age. So how, what is that evolution? First, that will be in the development process itself. We've very much heard about the waterfall process, where you get the requirements initially, document them, you spend three months documenting those. Then you go ahead and go through the phases of uh, designing it, implementing it, testing it, and finally delivering that. Some application uh, six months down the line, and that's all good and well. It's built as exactly as per the requirements that were needed, but the reality remains that over those six months, customer requirements have changed. What the customer thought he wanted is different from what he actually needs. And once he starts using the platform, that's when he recognizes that there is a need for change. But what are you going to do at this point? Uh, it's a costly process where you have to restart the entire process again. So that's where the development process moved from the, the waterfall method to the agile method. And what is the agile method? So instead of doing one run of 100%, you do five runs of 20%, for example. So where in each of those 20%, you deliver a certain amount of capability, you hand it over to the customer, the customer looks at it, uses it, gives his feedback, and then you can go ahead and deliver the next 20%. Uh, while, while delivering that 20%, you're, you're delivering extra functionality as well as doing some sort of changes on the previous run to better, feed, uh, better fit the customer's, re your requirements. And then uh, at the end, after five iterations, you have something that is close to what you wanted and very much close to what you will continue to use because you are satisfied with what you got. That's all great for the developers, but what about the operations teams? They are left out because in the end, this development process does not include the operations teams. And that's where DevOps comes in. I'm gonna be talking more about that later. So the next aspect is about application architecture. We've always heard of you know, having monoliths and N-tier or three-tier architecture. So that was where you had a huge mainframe that had the entire application stack and then you started breaking that down further in the last decade or so into three tiers. So you have a web tier, an app tier, and a database tier. But the reality remains that regardless of if one of these tiers was to go down, you would have downtime. And the fact is that all the application logic remains in the app tier. So that's not real division as such. What's happened is people have moved from that logic to a microservices architecture, where basically you build your services not by the, the tier of whether it's web, app, or database, but rather by the business functionality that you can deliver. And I'll be talking more about that as well. The next aspect is about the hosting. So people always had their data centers, you know, these huge data centers, which are basically rooms filled with you know, a lot of racks, a lot of servers, making a lot of noise, and you know, using a lot of electricity and cooling, and being uh, an internal service. And then now people have, that was a transition towards a hosted service where basically you would have a collection of organizations all underneath one umbrella, basically hosting their services and grouping together and bring, uh, there's a service provider providing that function. And then now the, the next phase of it, which is basically the cloud, where you know, for you, you're accessing the service, as a, but where, how is it hosted, where is it hosted, the availability, the redundancy is taken care by a cloud provider. And People are looking to move towards that, but there are some challenges in moving towards cloud, and how do we solve that? Not necessarily always in the data sovereignty rules, that is a very critical aspect, but there is also the aspect of how 
will you ensure that you, if you're running an application on your premise and you would like to burst or you need the capacity to move or you want to move it from your on-premise to let's say Azure or from Azure to uh, IBM Cloud, how do you actually do that? How do you get that portability? And that's another challenge. And finally, what we see is the methodology of how people are basically building applications has moved and that has gone from having physical servers where you have one server, one application towards virtualization where you know on one physical server you have many virtual machines and each virtual machine hosting an application and then we're looking at the transition which is the next step which I would say is the virtualization of the application layer where you have a single application on, in a container with all its dependencies and that means that you can host on a single server multiple applications without having the OS layer in between. So let's see how that's done. Let's go through the different different aspects. So to, next, the, the, to start off with, we're talking about DevOps. So as I said, we had the waterfall method, we had the agile method, and then let's introduce the developers into it. So what's happened is over the years, we had a lot of innovation over processing speeds, over languages, over methodologies. But what we see is that there is always a friction when you're moving from developers to operations. What happens is developers build their code and operations teams, they get handed over the code as a, as a file and given a set of instructions says, go and put this on you know, the staging or the production environment. And then you have this challenge of, okay, uh, I'm gonna do that, but it's not working here when I try to test it out. And then the developer says, well, it works on my laptop and works in my development environment, so you know, the problem must be on your side. And then the, the operations team say, we have not done anything, so you, know, you guys have to fix it. And always this friction has existed. And we believe that DevOps is the way to solve this. So what is the definition of DevOps? There are a lot of definitions out there, but uh, I, the one I like the most is being able to do things simpler, faster, and in a repeatable manner. And so what are the basic tenants or the core tenants that make any process DevOps? They're the following. First of all, that it's standardized. So that basically means that every time you run it, a process, you get the same output. Number two, that's automated, so that there should not be any manual intervention. The fact is that you should have be able to kick off a job where you want to create a development environment for a new developer or make a copy of your production environment and it does not require any further human intervention. And finally, that it should have the process for continuous improvement. You should be able to understand that where is the process taking more time, where can it be further optimized, where can there be more automation so that you can achieve a truly DevOps process. So further talking about what are the basic building steps of it, DevOps has that everything is as code. So now it's not always only infrastructure as code or application as code, everything is code. The fact is that you have the way that you want your application or your environment to look built in as code and that means that it is always releasable at any point in time. You, it's not only about waiting for Thursday evening. It could be done on a Thursday morning. It could be done on a Sunday morning. Yeah. You have the rebuild versus repair philosophy. This is always what causes this friction between developers and operations. The fact that we do changes in our environments. The developer gets a development environment. He goes and updates a version of the Java. Or the operations team goes and secures a different, you know, something in staging or production and does not reflect that in development. So because this is because of the repair philosophy. We go in and we do tweaks on the end product. What we should do is have a golden image and that is what we will tweak. And then at any point in time, that is what is uh, basically released and made sure that that works. We should always obviously have automated testing. We should have some sort of pipeline methodology so that we have the, the different stakeholders placed in. So whether that could be that you need to be able to check in your application file in a repository. You need to do some sort of testing. That could be unit testing for your application. You need your security team to verify that you have no malware, no uh, vulnerabilities existing in your application stack. And so that's another gate. Finally, it could be a gate that is about management having their approval, looking at the overall process and deciding whether they want to go forward or not. So all of these are what we call as a pipeline and that is a basic tenant of DevOps. We believe with this aspect of people understanding what the process is and you having the technology to do that, you can achieve 
this DevOps principle, which will then make the friction that exists between developers and operations disappear. What is the next tenant? Uh, the next aspect, the monolith versus microservices that I was talking about, the application infrastructure. So it's very well known that you know, uh, when you have a, a monolith, you build everything together as one big application and release it. And anytime a change needs to be done, that needs to be done on that application and move forward. Whereas a microservice is a different method, is a different mindset. Let's go through it. So let's say we have a sample application. It's a very simple application, probably everyone can relate to it. Let's say that we are talking about an airline booking system. So in an airline booking system, you have three major areas. I mean, we have a lot of them, but let's talk about those three major ones. First one is a registration. So you register to get onto the portal, you have an account. Next thing you do is a service inquiry. So you're looking for flights. So you do a service inquiry for that. Finally, you do a payment so that you can actually you know, book a flight. If you were to do this as a monolith, what's gonna happen is that you need to tightly couple all the different business functions into one unit. What are the disadvantages of this? The disadvantages of this is that you need to build using one technology stack. So let's say that your backend, you need a database. The fact is that because this is one unit, it needs to be able to connect to one database. And you, know, you are basically restricting your technology stack. That is one aspect. The other aspect is that you generally in business have different owners for the registration, different owner for the service inquiries, different owner for the payment. Now, when you have one single unit, anytime a change needs to be done, that change needs to be verified across the entire list of stakeholders. That increases the, the testing time and that increases the number of stakeholders that leads to a, a delayed release than what would normally be required. And the, fi the final aspect of it is the scaling. So let's say that you're getting a lot of load. It's the, the start of uh, you know, the business and you know, everyone is registering. Uh, let's just say that for an example. Yeah? So when everyone is registering, you, that means you're going to have a lot of load on the registry, but maybe not enough people paying. So what's going to happen? You still need to scale up your entire application to meet that load, either horizontally or vertically. So that means that there's a lot of unused capacity within the service inquiry and payment that's not used. And the reality in airlines is going to be the opposite. Actually, there's going to be a lot of people, 99% of people doing service inquiries, looking for flights, looking for prices, looking for availability. And you know, 5% of those people are doing payments. But if you go for the monolithic structure, you're going to have to basically size up for those 99% or 95% of people who are doing the service inquiry. Let's talk about a microservices architecture. In the microservices architecture, you split your business function so that each function or business function has its own independent uh, set of resources. That could mean that it has its own web application and its own database. And what that means is that you can, first of all, independently scale these. So as I told you, it's going to be a lot of load on service inquiry, but very, bit on, very few on payment. You can scale use your resources in a better optimized manner and have them actually for the service inquiry. The next aspect of it is the, the backend technologies that you want to use. You're not limited to a single set of technologies because of the fact that you have to combine all of them together. You want to use, uh, you know, for your payment, uh, a relationship database? Go ahead and use Microsoft SQL or Oracle database, sure. For your uh, registry, you need to register people's passports, you need to register the Emirates ID, for example. Sure, go ahead. You can have a NoSQL database, a MongoDB, uh, that's sitting there. For your service inquiry, you need a lot of caching? Go ahead and have a Redis server in between. That's not a problem. And the fact is that you don't need to have it for the entire stack. You only have it for the business service that you want. Because of the fact that each service owner is independent, they can do their changes on their application stack without impacting the other application stacks as long as they, in the sense of a function, provide the service that you need. So, you know, as long as I can query your web service and you tell me uh, that, you know, how uh, the thing what you call, what, what is the payment amount? I'm happy with that. You know, I don't need anything else from you. You can work however way you want to internally. So that's the advantage. Now, now let's talk about the other aspect, which is moving to the cloud. So <laughs> this is a, a funny slide I have uh, that, you know, when people say they want to move to the cloud, you know, they have this overall vision, but the execution remains lacking. And uh, there's a very a serious issue behind this, but, and I'll explain to you what that is. So basically, we're talking about portability of your applications. You have an application that you or your developer builds on a laptop. How can you ensure that that same application is moved to your development environment or your staging environment or your production environment? Normally, you'll have 
different OS layers, you'll have different stacks for each environment. Suppose you're moving that from your production to you have a requirement to have it on a private cloud. That's a different stack itself and public cloud is a totally different stack. So the portability, while people have tried this out, it's not existing. So that is where the challenge has been when we say that you, know, you want to transition to the cloud. Yes, people can transition to the cloud or people can stay on premise, but being able to move back and forth between these two, that's where the challenge lies. So we as Red Hat, we believe that containers are the solution that will help you for these three different challenges. So how do containers help? Let's look through that. So we said containers are the solution. That's great. What exactly are containers? Well, if you look into the slides, it'll show you the basic containers are application building blocks. They're made into layers. So you will have the base layer, which could be you know, your rel image. And on top of that, you add layer one, layer two, layer three. What are these layers? So layer one, we're going to take from the infrastructure team. These are your OS requirements. These are basically the, the apps and the configurations that you want that should be there within any application from the infrastructure side. Then we go to the enterprise architect. And let's get from the enterprise architect all the middleware runtime details that you need. So that means that you know, this is the Java version that you should have. This is the integration bus connectivity details. This is you know, the, 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 the software and the dependencies you need to run uh, a Java application. And finally, let's go and get from the application guys, what is the actual application we're going to run? So the binary. So we take the binary, the middleware layer, and the infra layer, bundle them all up together, get something called a golden container image. You know, I'm just saying golden, it's a container image, but this is basically the source of truth. This is being built, and now this can be built in many ways, so the fact is that you could reuse the, the infra and the middleware layer, and then have a, a second developer give you a different set of application binaries. So if you're running different binaries, you can still control the underlying infrastructure, middleware and infrastructure layers. What happens is this is a self-contained application. With this, you would be able to go ahead and run this application wherever you want as long as you have a container runtime. So let's look at them side by side, VMs and containers. What's the difference? So as the slide shows you, basically on the left-hand side, we have our physical server, on top of which we put a hypervisor layer, so VMware, Red Hat Virtualization, Hyper-V, whatever you want, Zen, and then you will basically carve up that physical uh, server into virtual machines, each having its own OS, so you need to have another operating system, uh, and then on top of that, you will have the application dependencies and the actual binary. So for each application, you're basically consolidating them from having them on different physical servers to having them on one physical server, but you still are not consolidating the operating system. You need to have a, single, a separate operating system, system for each one of them, and you need to have the hypervisor layer that will do the actual carving of the physical server. On the right-hand side, let's look at how containers are doing, operating. So you have the same physical server on top of which you put rel. So that is the OS, the single OS that's required, and then what RHEL does with the container daemon, which is built in to the kernel. So there's no additional applications required. It used to be the fact that you could go with Docker, that is what Docker used to do, but now we as Red Hat, we have basically our own runtime that we built into the OS layer, and that is, first of all, more secure and does not require root access. With that container runtime, we carve up physically, or sandbox, the RAM, the CPU, the memory, etc and allocate to each container its own space on which it can have the application that you want and the application dependencies that you want. And they do not interact with the other, st uh, the other containers that run on that same host unless you deem so. And interact meaning that you know, they interact through uh, the network calls as such. So what happens is that due to this, you could have two different web servers running that could have uh, different uh, dependencies, but still coexist peacefully on the same container host, on that same physical server. What are the advantages? Let's look at them both side by side. So when you look at this, you can see that for the virtual machine, you get the entire VM isolation. That's true. But you have high resource usage. You need to have uh, disk usage for the operating system, 
and then you have your application stack and the fact that, it's, that these are static and that you have the OS cost. If you look at the container side, you have the container isolation, so you still have your application isolation, but because of the fact that these are contains and applications and do not require that OS resource usage, so you don't have, let's say, a separate C drive as you would in Windows, you know, you have only the space that you need for your application. Your memory and CPU uses, resource usage is also dropped because of the fact that you don't have that OS requirement and finally the cost savings that you get from having a single OS and then having your applications run on those. So that's one thing. How does this help you? If you are moving from a monolith to microservices, the, the reality remains that you need to split those microservices into the business functions. That does not mean that you go from a single monolith to three microservices. It could be hundreds of microservices. Are you going to be having 100 VMs for a single application stack? No, but the fact is that if you have containers, that you could have those hundreds of containers if required and still not have the extra resource and the, uh, the licensing costs that come from an additional operating system. What else happens? The portability. Because of the fact that you are packaging this all into a single package, which means that I can build once and deploy anywhere. As you can see, I can build as a developer on my laptop. I give that entire container image to the operations guys. And now I just say, please go ahead and run it. Application guy, uh, operations guys can run it on the staging environment. It would run exactly how it did on the development or my laptop. And as long as, of course, the, uh, it moves towards the required resources. So in development, it goes to the development database. In staging, goes to the staging database. And those are all parameterized. So there's no need to change anything in the application stack. There's no need for any changes when you move from one environment to another. The fact is that all of those are parameterized and you are giving the package as is. So if it runs on your laptop, it will run the same way on the server. And again, the same thing for the production. So that means that you get actual portability. The other advantage is, suppose you want to port this from your on-premise to your cloud, you'd even be able to do that. Because of the fact is that as long as you have that RHEL layer and RHEL runs everywhere, physical, virtual, private cloud, public cloud, you would be able to run your containers in any location. And that gives you true portability true freedom from lock-in. The other advantage is build once, deploy anywhere. And that's what I'm showing you. Developer builds, and then that same image is promoted from development to testing, to staging, to production. This gives a peace of mind well, for both for the developers and the operations teams to ensure that they know what they're doing. So we've talked about containers. We showed the advantages of containers over VMs how they can help you out, but how do you get started? So with any container, it's exactly like how you took the phase from bare metal to virtual. You need to have a hypervisor, so you need to have a container host. That, but do you have a single container host? No, no application is an island, the same way it is for containers. You would have sets of container hosts so that you have the high availability features, the fault tolerance features, the networking capabilities, the security capabilities, the access control capabilities, the operational requirements for you know, logging and metrics. Where are you gonna get all of those done? So that's where for day one and day two operations, you need something called a container orchestration solution. So if you were to look at the market four years ago, the container orchestration solution basically segmented into small groups that you, uh, you would say basically composed of Kubernetes, which is from Google, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Rancher, Docker Swarm, and Mesosphere, and a few other smaller players. But if you look at it today, the market has consolidated, and basically Kubernetes is the king. Kubernetes has the mar majority market share and has been crowned the de facto king of container orchestration solutions. And you would even see that people who previously had competing solutions, have moved on to Kubernetes and are following that. So that means that everyone's following Kubernetes. We agree with that, but what we want to say is that Red Hat was at the start. So we have the first mover advantage. We've been with Kubernetes since it was open sourced by Google, it's in 2015, and we are a majority contributor to Kubernetes. What does that mean? What that means is basically that we not only take 
from Kubernetes, but we also give back to Kubernetes. We are the second biggest contributor to Kubernetes, and we are the second biggest influencer of the direction of Kubernetes, and what are the features and capabilities that it has, and that is a real advantage towards our customers. What that means is that whenever we have a new version of Kubernetes, we can go ahead and take it from the upstream project, which is available for everyone. We go ahead and first of all, secure it, harden it, test it, and certify it with software and hardware vendors. And we ensure a nine-year certification lifecycle. That means that you can take the upstream version, which is always changing and has no uh, single sort of support, point of support, towards Red Hat's certified Kubernetes, which is basically OpenShift. And that gives you the peace of mind of having stability, the peace of mind of having security, the peace of mind have, uh, having support, and the peace of mind that whenever there is a new vulnerability that is discovered, what we as Red Hat do, because of the fact that we are such a heavy contributor, is that we know the code in and out. We can go and give you the required fix for that bug, rather than going and saying, please upgrade to the latest version. As long as you're on a supported version from Red Hat, you have the peace of mind that Red Hat will give you a patch for any vulnerability. So whenever a new vulnerability is found, Red Hat ensures that new vulnerabilities are patched. And our record has been 97% of the time within 24 hours and 99% of the time within the first week. And that shows you the difference between Red Hat and the competition. So what happens when you have Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform? You basically have a platform that can run on-premise, in a virtual environment, in a private cloud, in a public cloud like Azure, AWS, Google, or IBM. And then on that platform, you can go ahead and have your traditional applications. So if you have applications that you're running today and you want to get the container benefits, go ahead and move those into containers. You can have your ISV products, so Red Hat middleware, IBM middleware, AppDynamics, F5, anyone who is supporting to run on OpenShift, you can move their products onto OpenShift. So that means you get your ISV products there. And you can go ahead and build your cloud native greenfield new applications on that, as well as you know, machine learning and AI. And that basically means that this is the platform for the future. And that is what we are providing you with Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform. So what are the advantages for the operations team? Basically, they have automated operations. They can go for multi-tenancy. They get the secure by default capabilities. They have the option for basically chargeback and showback, so metering. They are able to be, uh, control the access, uh, in a, uh, their network access. They have OpenShift running, and that OpenShift can be running on-premise, on a virtual machine environment, in a private cloud or a public cloud, and also have the seamless back and forth. So that gives the operations or the IT uh, infrastructure team the capabilities, the operational capabilities they're looking for. And as you can see, it is secure by default. We secure both the uh, all three layers, which is the application layer, we secure the infrastructure layer, and we also have it pluggable so that you can get third-party vendors like Palo Alto, uh, Twistlock, you Trend Micro, uh, the HashiCorp Vault solutions, basically any sort of SIM, vaulting, security solutions, uh, malware so, uh, anti-malware solutions, all of them are also basically extendable within OpenShift. What do the developers get? They get a self-service uh, self provisioning portal. So that means that they, the operations team can define what is available for a developer. And then that, that developer can go ahead and just request for the services, of course, with quotas and controls as, uh, as authorized by the operations team. But that removes the dependency of having to wait on another human being. They have the capabilities of uh, having the CI CD pipelines out of the box. They have the capabilities of basically building their applications to be containerized by default so that the developer can focus on the application. And OpenShift gives them the capability of going directly from source 
to a container image, i.e. provide me the source code of what you want to run, what sort of platform you want to run it on, Python, PHP, Java, .NET Core, and then I will give you a container that is having your source code packaged as a binary and being able to run on it. Now, those are some of the capabilities. They also get the, the logging and the metrics. They can actually follow through for a request to see what happens. And the, the technology stacks that are supported are various. So th that is uh, the core advantages that the developers get. What are the other cases? So where do you want to run this? Uh, quite frankly, you can run it wherever you want. You can see over here that we're showing you that OpenShift runs on Azure, either as a managed service or using infrastructure as a service and then installing OpenShift as an application. The same can be talked about for AWS, for Google Cloud, for IBM, and of course, on-premise as the customer requires it. And the supported platforms are, quite frankly, the majority of all the platforms we see. Uh, VMware, Red Hat Virtualization, uh, Bare Metal, OpenStack, um, and the list is extensive. So when we talk about customer references, uh, Quite frankly, we have more than 2,100 customers around the world who, who are utilizing OpenShift and the capabilities that it gives them to go and onboard their applications and run them in a uh, cloud-native, uh, microservices, DevOps-based culture. And if you were talking about locally, we're here we have some public references from this region. First of all is Emirates NBD, and quite frankly, their WhatsApp banking, which uh, quite frankly is, uh, is very innovative in this region, I would say certainly. Uh, is running on top of OpenShift, and it shows you the capabilities that they were able to add on top of their core banking functionalities. So basically start adding microservices around WhatsApp, internet banking, mobile banking, et cetera, that they can keep adding and extending their core functionality with uh, OpenShift. Another example we have, and this is from out of the region, but of course this shows you the, the extent of which it does, is Lockheed Martin, and in fact that the development that they had for the F-22 and F-35, they included uh, OpenShift clusters within that uh, for their communication purposes, and that just shows you the range of where you can use OpenShift and the fact that what are the gains that they got from basically utilizing OpenShift within their environment. So to recap, why we would like to go for containers is because we want to enable microservices, so monoliths to microservices, we want to go and have a DevOps platform. So first of all, not only having a waterfall and going to Agile, but then involving the operations teams in that to basically get a DevOps culture. And being enabled to go to cloud, whether that is public cloud, private cloud, no problems, or government cloud, that's also capable. And the, the fourth advantage you get is to move away from the traditional uh, bare metal and virtual machines towards a, uh, a virtualized application, which is basically what container gives you, and the portability that you get with that, so the, to avoid the lock-in. So Red Hat, first of all, you have the container basis, the container orchestration platform, quite frankly, the industry standard is Kubernetes, and what we like to say is that with Red Hat OpenShift, you are getting the enterprise Kubernetes container platform, and as you can see here, Red Hat is the, the second biggest contributor to Kubernetes. We influence it so we can, in, in fact, enable and control the direction in which it goes, and we have done that for our customers. Uh, and quite frankly, the comprehensive aspect of how we do uh, our container platform that was shown here. Is that all? Do you only get a platform? No. With our services team, we make sure to enable you so that you have, we have a container adoption program that basically ensures that you get containers into your enterprise in a proper manner. We enable your teams with our open innovation labs. We get them in and involved and get them into the culture of how to do DevOps. So it's not only about giving you the technology, it's also about getting your people into the process. So you get the full triad of people, process, and technology in your environment. I'll be going through the overview of the OpenShift container platform and giving you an idea of uh, how it can be used. Currently we're at the login screen and you can see that I'm going to go ahead and use my account. My account has been given administrator access so there is role-based access control so we can use Active Directory, LDAP and other providers like SAML. When I go ahead and log in, the first thing that happens is that as I said since I'm an administrator I get the admin console we also have the ability to go as a developer, if required. 
So here on the initial page, we have the ability to create projects. So projects are basically isolations where we can enforce quotas, limits, and give access to the appropriate teams. An example of creating projects would be dev, test, staging, and production. Or it could be created by the group or the function of the group. So HR, that's one example. We can have more such as finance, So what are we trying to achieve with this console? Let me give you an insight of what exactly it is. So the logic of it is that basically there are different domains within IT. So you have the network teams who are basically providing the network access control, security teams in charge of vulnerabilities and compliance, operations teams who have to do monitoring and day two maintenance, developers who are trying to build and deploy their applications, infrastructure team providing the application environments, the high availability, the reliability, and the ecosystem, and storage admins providing the persistent storage that can be used by the applications. Normally what will happen is, as any request, you will go and individually talk to these teams, and they have their own systems in which they will utilize it, or they will give the access. What we're trying to do here is basically have OpenShift be the singular console where the network admins can log in, and have their control on the network as ports, uh, network control, so the which applications can talk to the other applications, what are the, the methodologies in which you can go have traffic going externally, internally. The storage admins can go ahead and provide that sort of block of file storage that's available and that can be utilized by the applications that are hosted on OpenShift. Security teams can then define uh, what is the compliance level uh, what is the the uh, and do the correct inspection on the traffic that is going on between these applications the developers have a portal in which they can go ahead and deploy their applications the infrastructure teams can 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 detail exactly how they would like the infrastructure to look so that the developers have to give the final layer which is the applications but the underlying layer is provide, provided by the infrastructure and the application middleware teams and the operation teams have the capability of doing the monitoring on the overall like, uh, environment so what we're doing is basically bringing all of these functions together and keeping them in within one platform which is OpenShift and then we're going to be going through this platform now to see all the different capabilities and see how everyone is enabled by this platform so now that we understand how the the platform works in general for all the different domains. Let's look at it from a developer perspective. I am going to go and change my role to become a developer. I'm inside the finance application. And let's say now, me as a developer, what do I get from this platform? First of all, you get a self-service catalog. So let's go and look at the catalog. You can see from this catalog that we have quite a lot of options. Basically, instead of the developer going and selling the infrastructure team, I need a new development environment, or I need this database, or I need this sort of uh, runtime. The developer has the capability of whatever is enabled by the infra team that they can go ahead and choose from a self-service catalog. So regardless whether the database is MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, Maria, and Microsoft SQL, and plus others that can be configured, or uh, that I need uh, a Python front end, because I'm going to be building a machine learning application. So basically, I can go ahead as a developer and say, I want to go and build a Python application. Now, what happens is, as this is a container platform, it can only run containers. But me being a developer, I my main focus is writing an application. So I have written an application in Python, which is available in my source code re repository. And this is a very simple application, which ba basically goes and takes a random color and then creates a page with that color. What I'll do is I will go and take the location of that application code, go in and say I want to deploy my application. So you'll notice now that as a developer, what I am doing is basically providing the location of my application code and what language it is in. Other than that, I am not knowing anything of how to build or deploy containers. 
So I will go ahead and keep the defaults just to show you guys and let's go ahead and create our application. When we click the create, what happens? Let's go and see. Basically, uh, the build is running. So the first step that OpenShift Container Platform does is that looking at the logs, goes to the location of our source code and copies that source code. Once the copy is done, it will do some analysis and it will build the application uh, uh, binary. So once it builds a application binary, it requires some additional capabilities, which would be the dependencies. And it will take the application binary, the dependencies, and layer those in to make a container. It will store that container image in a registry, which is, in, which is built into OpenShift. And from that registry, it will go ahead and deploy an application file. So you can see right now, it's doing all of those tasks. It's built the binary right now, uh, in this case. It's getting the required dependencies, which it's done. So if this location, you can see it got the required dependencies, collected all of them, and then it created a container image that it pushed to the registry. Once it pushes that to the registry, you will notice that there is a container up and running. Now, how do I access this application? Well, there is the capability to keep uh, an application internal so that it's not externally available, but also we can expose a route, which is a networking function where we give a URL and that URL will take us to the container application. So it's taken the, the, the purple color in this instance, as I said, it's a random color, but this shows you how easy it is for a developer from building his application code to having it up and running on OpenShift Container Platform. So now we've looked at it from a developer perspective. Let's look at it from an admin perspective. As admins, we would be interested to give it a high availability, to give scaling, to control the routing, etc. So let's move to the administrator uh, view. If I was to look at the workloads, I can see that I have one container that's been running and that's servicing them. Let's go and say that we want high availability now. So instead of a single container, I want multiple. In the traditional sense, if you wanted to do this, you would have to create an additional VM, you'd have to create a load balancer, you would have to install the application, and then you would be set to have high availability. How can we do this in a container platform? And our OpenShift, just go ahead and click to increase the number of pods. So you can see right now, that I am scaling it from one to two and two to three. So I've scaled my application up. Does that mean now that I can see the different container uh, containers servicing my application? No, and uh, there's a reason for this. The reason is that from a network networking perspective, the default configuration is to have a sticky session. So once you connect to this application, you'll be serviced by the same container and again and again. Let's go ahead and do the change. So this would be basically a networking admin. A networking admin. I'll go ahead, connect to the route, so the external route that was available. I can go and say edit, and this is how easy it is for me to do it. So basically I have to add in two values. Let me go ahead and show you those two values. One is the balance, which I have to set it to round robin. And the other one would be to disable the cookies so that it will take those settings. Once I've done that, let's go back and check the application URL, the external URL. And you will notice now that I'm connected to a different application in each sense. So I'm just going to go on to you can see there's actually one, uh, two yellows and one purple. So this shows you the round, the load balancing in the round robin. Let us now go and investigate the high availability. So now we know that we have a capability to access all of the applications. Let's talk about what happens if a, 
the container was to fail or if one of the servers that are saying service that are hosting this container was to fail so let's go and simulate a failure what will happen is this container would fail immediately true but then immediately then the the orchestration platform would create a replacement container which is what you see up here and this container will be created immediately to replace the one that failed so there is uh, a controller always looking at how many pods do I need which we have set to three how many are currently running and if it's less than three it will go ahead and create it so that it gets replaced so you'll see now that we have it available and if I was to talk about the availability you would notice that there would be no drop at all from the load balancer it's going to ensure that when that application service is back up and running so we have it up and running in this case you will see that it is available so that is in the context of high availability and load balancing so there is an inbuilt load balancer available and we have the capabilities of the networking to change the routing specifications to make it round robin or not now what happens in case the developer releases a new version of the application so I'm going to go log in and I'm going to edit this so once I edit this file I will change it from the, the options that we have and make it uh, red and green commit the changes when I commit those changes my source code has changed but now I need to reflect that in my application so how do I do that let's go back and go become a developer uh, in the developer view I would go and it would be a single button to say dear OpenShift I've done some change in my source code can you please go and get the new version so once I do that action it will start a new build which it's started over here and if we were to view the logs it would be similar to what happens before which is that it goes and gets the new source code clones it copies it and it will update the container image to become version 2 so we have version 1 which is what we have currently running and now we're going to get version 2 but the the interesting the thing that I would like to point out over here is the way that the transition happens we have a capability called rolling updates rolling update means that right now if I have three pods running when the new version is available and completed I will have a replacement of these three pods or the containers that are running but the transition will be seamless in that I will go ahead and have one new container running and then decommission an old one and then do the same so that I have two of the new version and one of the old version and three of the new version and one of the thing and zero of the old version and so that way there is never a service loss for the end user you can notice here that I still have my application being serviced at, at this point and now you can see that there is a change that is happening and if I was to show you the change you would notice that still we are getting service from the older containers and at a certain point we are transitioned over to the newer containers and the old so you can see that as I keep refreshing the page now it has transitioned to the new container platform it seems that we have all of them to be uh, red so the the randomness has just made it so that it has become all red so let us just wait and see if we get one of the other colors so it does not seem to be the case just to make it uh, more interesting for ourselves let's go into the admin view and we can go ahead and just delete one or two of these that are running so that we can get a, color, a pod that is of a different color now it's as if I'm showing you the high availability again I, I do have one container running and while it's running and then the other one the newly created one comes in to the load balancer and is available so there is a seamless transition so that you are able to do changes in your application code without affecting the end user front so now after we looked at our previous demos which was uh, basically around the operations and the developer let's make it take it all together and explain what we can do 
the area of AI, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning is really taking off. And with OpenShift, we believe that we are the perfect platform to cater to your AI and ML needs. Uh, quite frankly, with Open, Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform, you have the capability to gather and prepare your data. That could be sometimes using Jupyter Notebooks. You can have different data scientists de developing models uh, again on uh, their platforms and then once these models are available we have the capability to deploy these models using business rules engines or any other methodology that you can think of and they embed them into the applications and once we embed them into the applications of course we can have that constant monitoring and feedback and saying making the uh, the model better and better over time and you can see that basically we understand regardless of whatever stage we can cater to those requirements. So the demo that I'll be showing you right now is taking uh, all of these together, mixing and merging them, and then giving uh, a very uh, useful, uh, uh, very uh, relevant use case for you. So uh, let's start. So basically what I've done is I've created a new machine learning project. And to start off, let's go into the developer view. And once we're in that developer view, uh, the first thing I want to do is show you the capabilities that come with the object detector. So let's go and say that we want to make a, an image classifier. And I've been showing you from catalog. Let's go ahead and say that we have a container image that's accessible to us. And if I put in this container image name, uh, the location, uh, we can go ahead and deploy this. I'm going ahead and uh, deploying this right now. And since this is an image, it doesn't require to build. I have already given it the image and it's already pre-built. So it's like a Go template that will, it will scale up and create the application from. So I'm just waiting for it to complete. Once it completes, then we can go ahead and open up the URL. Now, this application is currently uh, having two capabilities. One is an API access. So this is the uh, API access where we can you know, provide it over here, fi certain files, and it will return back the output. But generally, we would like to do it a in a more uh, uh, easier methodology, which is basically the web app. So that means this is like for human use. So now we have this capability available. Let's go ahead and upload a certain image and to show you what it is possible for this to do. Uh, let's go ahead and take uh, the car and bike image I have. Go ahead and browse to it, upload it, and then now, once we do that, what it's going to do is uh, it is going to analyze this image and then provide what it believes are certain uh, objects that it's filtered. Now, uh, it's already detected that it's a car and a motorcycle, and you can see the precision or the probability rate that our model detects it to be. We could even, you know, decrease the probability rate, and of course, this will not make a difference because the model has very accurately identified what it is. But you can see this sort of filter. Once I hit 92%, then it cannot know for sure this is a car, and so it will drop out. So it is all about ha understanding what pr probability threshold we want to keep and to keep on improving this. Let's go ahead and I'll show you another case, which is the case of the multiple cats. I'm just using some images we get from the internet. Here we have a picture of four cats. And now after it does the detection, at the threshold of 78%, it can only detect one of them to be a cat. But if we were to decrease the threshold, once we hit the 50%, or as you can see, 55%, that's when it will detect another one. And then once we hit the 43%, it will detect another cat. Now, this is where if you leave the probability to go lower, it starts detecting other things. Like right now, it has detected a dog. It has detected other things that are not relevant. So that's why we need to try and enforce that we have a higher probability. But of course, then the threshold uh, decreases some of the objects that could have been labeled. So this is just one example, how quickly we can get an object detector up and running using OpenShift. So obviously, the model has been pre-trained. And we have this available to go ahead and inject wherever we require. Now, let's take it a step forward. Let's say it's not only about object detection. Let's do some speech analysis. So how, do, how would this work? Let's go ahead and add an additional application. And our application is going to be a speech to text converter. 
So I got the URL for it, the location of where I have this container file. I will go ahead and put it in and then let's have it up and running. So what will this do? This will basically take in as input uh, an audio file. Uh, currently the model is for English. It could of course be for Arabic as well. And once it's up and running, we provide it a file and it can uh, go ahead and output what is the text, what is the speech in that file. So we have it available now. We can go and go and access the API. This is of course normally what a developer would do, but this is for us to just try it out. Now I do have some uh, files here, audio files. Let's just listen to them quickly for for your power is sufficient I said for reference so it says your power is sufficient your power is sufficient I said all right let's just try that out so this is the file that starts with 8455 we browse and find that file we can go ahead and select it and let's execute so basically now the application is analyzing the file that has been provided and we should get as output the the text that was set. So your power is sufficient, as I said. It's as I said, so of course there is some gap, but that's to be expected with a smaller train model. And it will get more and more efficient as we use it further and give more and more feedback. Let's try, uh, so what did, can we do with this? So we right now have taken some audio and we have converted that to text. Let's do some analysis on this text. Let's analyze whether this the text that came out is uh, a positive note or a negative sentiment. So there is something called a sentiment classifier. So once we go ahead and bring up that sentiment classifier, so you'll understand now that basically I'm bringing up different different applications that will form the, the different steps within a, a more complex application. So I'm just spinning up uh, the other next application which is going to be a sentiment classifier and the logic of the sentiment classifier is that it can take into input the text that comes from the uh, speech to, to text converter uh, and if and if we're worried about you know how it will handle the speeds we of course have the capability of putting in queues and API management uh, overhead tools so that we and that is coming available from OpenShift so and Red Hat. So now let's go ahead and say this is to try it out. So in this case I'm just going to put in some text. So let's say 2020 has been a hard year, has been really affected by the lockdown. So this is of course something that's true. Let's go ahead and see what happens when I execute that. The output that we'll get is a sentiment classifier which tells us whether this is positive or negative. So the classifier has identified there is a 0.07% chance that this is, this is positive. That's very valid. And it's a 0.99, 99.9% chance that this is negative. So, so now we know that when someone is taking some speech, we get the text, we can analyze whether it's positive or negative. What else can we do? We can basically add for the negative aspects of our speed, if anyone has having any negative, we can let's do a further analysis. And that's where we will be basically putting a, a toxicity classifier. And that would take only the negative comments. And then with those negative comments, we could basically analyze whether uh, how toxic is it, whether it is extremely bad and offensive, whether it is having some sort of obscene uh, portrayal, uh, whether there's a threat to someone, whether whether there is uh, an insult uh, thing aimed at someone, or whether this this text is uh, showing hatred, hostility, or violence towards any race, religion, gender, etc. So this once we have this up, so we have basically the the toxic comment classifier. We can then go ahead and put some text in. And uh, I'll be uh, showing you an example of the text. Um, this is, of course, just for um, uh, demo purposes. 
but it gives you an example, an idea of what can be strung together when we combine everything. So uh, let us say, uh, I do not like John. So this is a very simple text. And if I was to execute it, what would happen? We get some output from the classifier, which says that while it might be a negative sentiment, it is not having that sort of toxicity or obscene or it's not a threat or an insult or anything related to identity hate. So if I was to change this and say I will punch John, so of course, you know, this is as I said, all for, ref for demo purposes. But if I was to put that in, then we get a different identifier, and that is that this, this is a toxic uh, comment, and there is a threat aimed at someone. So you will see that the percentages increase. So it's a 51% chance of being a threat, a 96% chance of being a toxic comment. So this is just uh, a demo we're showing you of the capabilities that come of how quickly we can bring in certain applications, how we can basically combine these applications together, and we get uh, what it is that's required. Of course, this is a very generic demo, and anything that has to be uh, further enhanced uh, is where we can come in as Red Hat and show you uh, a more customized demo and show you the capabilities of OpenShift that we're just covering at a high level in this presentation and demo. From there, I would like to thank you all for the time that you spent with us, and I hope it was very educational. Please do get let us know uh, if we can help you further. Uh, with any of your requirements, specifically around uh, containers, microservices, and DevOps. Thank you very much.